Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our today's webinar broadcasted here from Overrad, close to Cologne in Germany. My name is Matthias Goiter. I'm head of marketing here at Spiegel and Tires Medizin Technik, and it is my pleasure of hosting today's webinar talking about vocal fold augmentation using Autologous FAT. Autologous FAT is not necessarily new to the ENT community. It has been around for decades and it has always been used for vocal fold augmentations. But honestly spoken, the medical outcome has always been somewhat questionable. So what exactly are we talking about today? Well, there is a new system and a new approach that allows a much cleaner, safer, faster, atraumatic, but also cell saving way of harvesting, processing and injecting autologous fat which eventually turns it into the ultimate game changer when it comes to the question, what filler is best for my patients? So to answer this question, I'm very happy to introduce to you our speakers that we invited to today's webinar. The next 20 minutes will be covered by Matthias Echternach. He's a professor of the University Hospital in Munich. He will talk about the... Um, anatomy, but also about the indication of um, autologous fat use for vocal fold augmentations. We will then listen to our second speaker, Frank Hauptner, who is a senior physician also at the University Hospital of Munich. He will talk about the benefits that come with autologous fat based on clinical data. And he will also show us a video that explains how he harvests and processes autologous fat. The last part of uh, the webinar then will be covered again by Professor Echternach. Uh, he will then talk about the outcome of phono surgery. For technical reasons, we decided to record all three presentations, but don't worry, the speakers will be around for your questions that you can send us during the next 60 minutes. You can use your um, chat option that you find at the bottom right side on your YouTube channel. Of course, that only works if you have signed in with your Gmail account, or you can send us a regular email to export at spiegel ties.com. Our questions will be then um, addressed in the last 30 minutes of this webinar. So um, now it's about time to get started. So please enjoy the next 60 minutes. And again, feel free to send us as many questions as you like. Thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here and to give you a presentation concerning fat augmentation using the Spiegel and Tice system in phono surgery. We do use this system for now more than two years, and we perform a study also concerning safety of syringes um, for the use in phono surgery, and therefore I have to state this as a disclosure of my talk. If we want to use it for phono surgery, we want to improve voice because phono surgery is associated to functionality and to voice production, not so much on the picture itself. It is not photo surgery, but phono surgery, as van Leyden stated before. So therefore, we have to go a bit in voice physiology in order to understand uh, how this material or how augmentation could improve our vocal function. First of all, voice is not the oscillation of the vocal folds. Voice are air pauses, are sound waves brought in the room by the airstream, which is fragmented by the oscillating vocal folds. So the reason are the oscillating vocal folds, but it is not the voice itself. Although we have more than 200 years of voice research, up to now we can't in every detail explain you what voice really is. And the problem is that there are more than one potential voice sources. As all of you know, 
of course, the book of thoughts are oscillating. And if these book of thoughts are oscillating, you they produce sound just by oscillation themselves. But the amount is considered very, very low. A second source is the air stream. So you have an exhalation. And this exhalation from the lungs to the mouth um, is brought to a very narrow passage, the book of thoughts. And after this passage, there are turbulences occurring. And such turbulences produce also um, a sound. And this sound is more like a noise. Last but not least, most amount of the voice source, so the sound which is produced within the vocal fault area, is produced by fragmentation of the airflow by the vocal faults. Well, if we have a look of the voice production system, the vocal faults themselves are usually oscillating, as shown here by the animation by Ingo Titze. And everything is starting with a subglottic pressure, because if you have a force, of an exhalatory force, which is brought to the area of the walk of folds, then you have a pressure. And this pressure usually is higher than the sub, uh, supraglottic pressure. And this is um, just um, influencing the transglottic pressure difference. Up to this transglottic pressure difference, there is an airflow through the glottis. Last but not least, also the adduction of the vocal folds play a major role because the adduction apart is nothing else than a resistance. And if you take these three columns, the transglottic pressure, the airflow, and the glottic resistance, you can bring it into a Ohm's law. When you increase the airflow, you have to increase maybe the transglottic pressure difference or decrease the uh, resistance of the walker faults. The walker faults themselves are not an easy system, but it is a layered structure. And the layered structure has an epithelium, then three lamina propria, the superficial one, the medial one, and the profunda one. And you have the muscle at the deep layer structure. And this system wants to oscillate, and these oscillate, uh, oscillations are not clarified in every detail yet. The oscillations themselves show a part where you have a total closure of the walker folds, then the, um, the glottis is opening, and then it is closing again. Therefore, the airstream is starting but it is a bit more in a latency and this latency is quite important because most of the sound production is brought in the phase where the book of faults are closing and where you have a maximum declination of the air flow which is the maximum uh, flow declination rate from these air pulse, there's a production of many many uh, sounds and these sounds have a harmonic structure that means if i talk to you i use maybe like 100 or 110 oscillations per second but at the same time there are sound waves like 220 330 440 and so on hertz and this is my raw material this is my voice source and this voice source is brought into a filter system and this filter system is called the vocal tract the vocal tract is a system um, consisting out of the uh, upper laryngeal areas the pharyngeal area and the oral and nasal cavities you can just uh, do here maybe recordings of mri technology do segmentations of the air column and you can just insert teeth and after that you could do printout models and out of these printout models you could assume how the resonatory properties of the vocal tract shape could be and this is like a filter if you put now a voice source into this filter the radiated spectrum from the mouth will be different and here you can see also every overtone and every harmonic structure of the voice source but still you find the peaks of the resonatory system every vowel is 
associated with a special uh, Fokker tract structure and therefore resonatory properties. And if you bring this voice source in a uniform tube, which has an open end at one side and closed end at the other, you would expect resonatory frequencies about 500, 1500 and so on hertz. And this is um, very much as it is in the uh, physiology for the vowel R. And this R in realistic data have nearly the same sound characteristics as you can see here. If you now open up the mouth and close the pharynx, then you go in an R position and the opposite for the E position and this changes the resonatory peaks. And also you could gain a bit more intensity in upper resonatory properties, which is called the singers formant cluster, which is shown here. So, in other words, the vowel condition is almost independent from the voice source. The voice itself is the, the fragmentation of the air stream by the vocal folds. Therefore, it's very important to analyze the vocal folds in stroboscopy. And if we have now the oscillatory system, there are three columns which are required. First of all, you need enough subglottic pressure in order to uh, initiate the oscillations of the Walker folds. Second, to drive the transglottic airflow. You need a lot of adduction. Otherwise, you would have only an airstream with turbulences, and this is a noisy sound, which is a bit like a breathiness. And last but not least, you need tissue which is able to oscillate. You need pliable, pliability here. And now some problems are occurring in voice uh, clinics. Mostly the subglottic pressure is not our major problem. You could remove one and a half long, and even though you would be able to produce enough subglottic pressure for the production of the voice. However, the adduction is quite problematic. That's also true for recurrent or vagus nerve palsies, for presbyphonia, for scar tissues, for the sulcus vocalis, or a defect after cordectomy, after cancer surgery. Last but not least, you have the problem of an pliability of the vocal folds. And this is problematic, of course, for scar tissue or even a defect after cordectomy. So, why the medialization of the book of Ford? The medialization could help. And if you have Hirano's famous picture here, you need a change of the divergent and convergent shape of the Walker folds in order to produce a latency for self oscillation. So, that helps the, uh, os uh, the oscillation itself of the Walker folds. And here you can see that the face of the um, Walker folds are quite different. So they have the mucosa wave running from uh, a lower part to the upper part and then going the latter away to the Morgani sinuses here. The oscillatory system is impaired by presbyphonia, scar tissues, or a bias sulcus vocalis. And here it would be meaningful, of course, to push the system in order to get a bit more an entrainment of both vocal folds. You could have a problem in the oscillatory properties by a scar tissue or by a defect after chordectomy. Then, of course, you have no total closure. If you have no total closure, the interruption of the airstream is not as great as it would be with a total closure. And therefore, you lose air and you produce turbulences and a noise here. The most important problem for older people is the question of the uh, strength of the uh, thyroarytenoid and the vocalis muscle. And we talk here about presbyphonia. Usually the vocal uh, muscle um, lead to the fact 
that the um, that there's a barking, but this barking is not directly at the free edge of the Walker Forts, but it's more at the medial surface. And this medial surface um, produce a stronger divergent convergent shape if there is a closure here, and therefore it strengthens the voice. And here you can see uh, from Titz's textbook a difference between the facetto and the uh, motor register, which is mainly caused by contraction of the vocal muscle. So once again, the convergent and divergent shape, the interaction here plays a major role for self-oscillation of the vocal folds. Why should medialization be considered? Well, if you have a stronger subglottic pressure, um, there could be the benefit, of course, that the area is closed, and therefore you have a stronger, um, with a stronger area, you have more buildup of the subglottic pressure here. The medialization has a strong effect on the adduction. Of course, because this is the main purpose of the medialization, thus it has, an, of course, an effect on the glottal resistance. And it could also have an effect on the pliability of the vocal folds. In very rare cases, sometimes you just adjust uh, some pliable tissue inside the um, lamina propria, but usually the better pliability is provided by greater oscillatory forces um, due to the fact that there's a stronger entrainment between left and right vocal fold. If you have an impairment of vocal closure, as shown here after cancer, usually you start with a voice therapy in order to achieve the best uh, result. After that, if it fails or if you still have pressure um, to restore the voice, you have two different um, possibilities to re-establish voice by means of surgery. One is the thyroplasty and the other one is an augmentation. So you fill in some material um, at the lateral proportion of the vocal folds. This is not a new technology. Already in 1911, Brünings uh, performed the first augmentation uh, procedure and later used it also fat with a high pressure syrinx. In 1916, Arnold used Teflon, but there were strong reactions after Teflon producing granulomas. Nowadays, there are a lot of materials on the market. Also, the thyroplasty is not a new technology. Already here, 1915, Pyre performed the first thyroplasty. And in 1974, Ishiki um, uh, performed his uh, great structure concerning the thyroplasties, introducing the thyroplasty type 1 nomenclature here. If we have a small look for the medialization by means of the thyroplasty, you can find here, of course, a paralyzed left walker fold. Now you see the uh, surgical approach where you build up a window within the thyroid. And then you could use cartilage as used here, or you could use a Teflon prothesis or um, Gore-Tex or whatever you want. And the great advantage is that you usually perform it in local anesthesia just to check um, the voice outcome. The other procedure is an injection, the augmentation of the vocal folds. And usually the placement is at the lateral position of the thyroarytenoid muscle. Um, sometimes, in rare cases, you could go also for the free edge, but I would not recommend that for artificial materials like silicon or like hydroxyl apatite. Um, sometimes fat could be used because it is on its own quite pliable, but most of the part you should use the lateral proportion here. Considerations are very important for the surgical approach. Do we use general anesthesia or do we use the local anesthesia? 
if we use um, the local anesthesia, there are some approaches which we use for the augmentation. You could go the transnasal way, the transoral way, the way which I do prefer, to be honest. You can go from the upper part of the thyroid or through the um, thyrocricoid membrane. And if we do it in general anesthesia, of course, you have a very high precision because you see immediately where you are, but you are not able to check the voice, of course. And this is the great disadvantage. But if the placement is very important, let's say for non-resolvable materials like silicon, um, then I would prefer the general anesthesia here. You see here now, of course, the Force. And now you see in general anesthesia uh, that you precisely can take the place where you want to add the material. And usually for the fat augmentation with Spiegel and Tice, we also use um, the fat augmentation by means of the general anesthesia approach because of the uh, fat removal from, um, from the periombilical regions. The local anesthesia is quite good because you could easily control voice immediately during the procedure as shown here on the right movie. Some general comments. If you have a very big defect, if you have a gap which is quite large, then I would prefer the general anesthesia approach. General precision required as already um, noted, I would prefer the general anesthesia. If there's a very strong gag reflex, you have no chance really to go the local anesthesia way. If you want to have a direct voice control and if there are any risk for general anesthesia, of course, the local anesthesia approach is very nice. But one thing is very important. If you go for the local anesthesia, the fear of the patient, the patients in the cinema, it's quite great. So you have to be a, sometimes more like a, 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 um, a psychologue in order to um, to do this surgery than being a surgery, surgeon on your own. There are a lot of material used for medialization. Um, historically, there's paraffin, there's Teflon, which should not be used anymore because of disadvantages. On the market, there's, as far as I know, one um, material which is permanent, which is silicon. There are nearly no side effects. There was one report, I guess, of uh, granulomas, but quite often it's quite stable, but it is very hard to remove if it is placed the wrong way. Sometimes hydroxyl apatites use radiesyl, hyaluronic acid is quite frequently used, but both are limited to one milliliter syringes. Also, which is used is collagen and water sometimes. Water, of course, you could use just as a quite easy test, but you are not really able um, to show how good it works because it is uh, diminished after seconds. You could use fat also with high pressure devices. To be honest, this is not very easy to use and I started with it and there were a lot of disadvantages and the high pressure was a risk not only for the patient but also for the nurses within the OR because sometimes the syrinx was going out of the, um, of the uh, fat devices. So now the now uh, the new um, technology is this centrifugation, which is great because it just um, divides the beneficial part out of the fat and the non-beneficial parts, which is the liquid oil and the blood. You don't want to have this so much. Why could fat be used? Um, in disagreement to some authors which should suggest a very permanent augmentation by this new approach, our experience is now for two years that quite frequently um, the effect disappears within, let's say, six to nine months. So therefore, I would consider this approach as a temporary one. However, 
it is a very very good approach because the patient likes the idea that there's something coming from his own body at a different place and it is not an artificial material you could use it easily for recurrent nerve palsy usually the way is at least in germany to do voice therapy first and after a year you use a, a surgical technique like an augmentation or thyroplasty but many people have problems here and not all patients want a permanent solution straight away so therefore it could be act as a test and it could be um, a predictor for a permanent material but also in very early cases after let's say thyroid surgery you could do an early augmentation and even if there is um, a coming back of the function of the um, of the uh, recurrent nerve then you have uh, the material only for a temporary effect so this could of course be for cases where you have a large gap and voicelessness where you have a voice dependent job professional voice users and it could be good for prevention of atrophy because of the collision forces during closure are um, much stronger obviously by um, a fat augmentation if there's any reduced lifespan due to maybe a thyroid cancer of course you could do immediately something to have voice in the last days sometimes it's also helpful in order to prevent aspiration to do this surgical approach using fat use the material here which is not permanent um, i would recommend to use a permanent material also one year after uh, after thyroid surgery in scar tissue of course you need a material which is pliable um, because you have no oscillation at the vocal folds and therefore um, you could uh, easily use fat which is pliable on its own cordectomy after larynx calcinomas it's quite interesting because usually if you take a laser surgery you do voice therapy and then you have a, a big gap due to the uh, substantial defect and you have scar tissue which could be at the inner perichondrium and this is very very difficult to re-establish one year after surgery so you have a large defect your scar tissue and sometimes even no inner perichondrium sometimes nowadays we use as a um, uh, a research project in early augmentation of the t1 larynx cancer and here we just remove the um, the cancer and in the same session after the margins are pathologically safe we immediately um, do a fat augmentation and there are a lot of advantages one is the tissue itself is soft and it could be easily medialized maybe dr hopner will talk about that maybe um, there could be stem cell effects and even if the fat is resolved after some month you have a quite good wall which is already in the midline position and therefore you don't have a need um, of a permanent medialization plastic one year after the problem of course is the tumor control which is maybe a bit to be discussed in general we have the tumor control as the only not beneficial thing the subclotic pressure should be expected on the short run and on the long term much better the pliability should be better not in every case to be honest and the adduction is also better and therefore we would predict that for the cases we have seen and we are doing here um, this early augmentation really gives a strong benefit if a surgical removal of low um, or small uh, cancers is performed this is the beginning and now dr hockner will talk about fat thank you so far dear colleagues ladies and gentlemen 
It's my great pleasure to share with you some of our research on characteristics of lipoaspirates and their possible applications in otorhinolaryngology. Within my presentation, I will give you an overview about the history of lipotransfer. We will go over some laboratory data on the characteristics of lipoaspirates in vitro. I will show you typical examples of harvesting and preparation techniques and we will talk about clinical studies and case examples for possible applications of lipoaspirates. The first described fat transplantation was published in Germany in the 19th century. Later on, several authors described their techniques on autologous fat transplantation. Very important works were done by Coleman and most of those studies were focused on treating facial scarring. Very important findings over the years were that fat should be aspirated at low pressure for reinjection and there were multiple devices available for harvest and injection over the last decades. Fat should be always cleaned from blood to improve the graft survival. Microinjection seems to work well for smaller defects. Important advantages of lipotransfer include that fat is easy to harvest and fat is an natural material with a high biocompatibility and there are long-lasting effects possible. Also risks were described in the literature. Lipotransfer can be associated with bruising and swelling. There is always a discussion about the resorption rate and the risk of asymmetrics cyst or capsule formation and fat embolisms are described as well as donor defects. The use of fat grafts in otorhinolaryngology is also established over several decades. Typical indications are the vocal fold augmentation, the tuba aperta, and volume deficits, for example, after tumor resection or external radiation to augment the base of the tongue. The use of lipotransfer in general plastic surgery goes beyond the volume deficits correction, for example, for breast augmentation and includes also the treatment of chronic wounds. Important principles and steps to be successful in fat grafting and lipotransfer include the typical steps of harvest, processing and infiltration. It is very important that all of those steps have to be performed very gentle and as atraumatic as possible. Over the years, multiple devices were available as well as for harvesting and reinjection of fat. It is important to point out that those cannulas have to be sterilized and the reuse is always an issue. That is why today we prefer single-use instruments for liposuction processing and reinjection of fat. There is a lot of discussion in the literature what kind of harvesting method is the best. Today we know that liposuction is superior to fat resection due to several advantages. Liposuction is easier to perform, it is less invasive and cell viability as well as the amount of stem cells is higher if you use liposuction devices. 
it is also possible to remove oil and free fatty acids after liposuction. If you compare manual versus powered instrument liposuction, there is also a little bit of a difference with um, advantages at the side of manual handheld assisted liposuction versus powered instruments. The next step is the centrifugation process. The American Academy of Plastic Surgery has a fat grafting task force and they made the general recommendation to isolate viable adipocytes via centrifugation. It is important to use this centrifugation from our point of view after handheld liposuction to remove debris and to prevent fibrosis. We know also that lipoaspiration followed by centrifugation has no effect on cell viability. In general, there are two ways to re-inject fat tissue. If you use fat as a filler for soft tissue augmentation or to treat facial scars, you typically use a step incision first and then you can insert a blunt cannula and inject the fat in a retrograde fashion. If you use fat for vocal fold augmentation, you typically use those sharp injection cannulas to get an filler effect as described on the right hand side. Now let's go into some details how we are performing a lipo transfer today using the voice inject system. It's important to prepare the donor area first and after cleaning the area, we are injecting local anesthetics. Typically, we are using 1% lidocaine with one in 200,000 epinephrine and we are injecting subcutaneously in the lower abdomen about 5 to 10 cc. After waiting for a couple of minutes, the next step is performed. We are using either a small step incision using a 11 blade or we are using this sharp cannula to open up the entry hole for the lipo suction cannula. Then the liposuction cannula can be introduced into that hole and liposuction can be started. The liposuction is then performed in a subcutaneous plane. This is very safe and can be performed quickly by bimanual palpation staying always in the subcutaneous plane. Using this palpation technique, we have never seen any kind of injury to the deeper structures of the abdomen or any kind of bleeding. Typically, we are achieving an amount of 10 cc by this kind of liposuction process. In a standard case for the head and neck area, typically 10 cc of lipoaspirate are enough for the further processing. Now you would like to separate the 
blood and the oil from the cellular compartment. And this is performed by using the centrifuge. We are using this kind of centrifugation process with 3000 rounds per minute for five minutes to separate the debris, blood and oil in your lipo aspirate. If your centrifugation process was successful, you are achieving these fractions in your syringe. You have an oil fraction, the so-called stromal vascular fraction, and a phase with some saline, the local anesthetics and blood. These are some data from our publication on the characteristics of lipoaspirates. The next step now is that you have to remove the oil and the blood from your syringe. This process is performed manually and has to be performed very gentle. The next step is that you have to transfer your lipoaspirate from the liposuction syringe into the injection syringe. And this is um, performed in that way that you are using this connector. And you can just fill up the amount of injection syringes you need. The techniques of injecting fat to the larynx will be described by my colleague Professor Echternach. I will show you now some laboratory data which were performed to analyze the material we are achieving from the voice inject system. And this is probably the most important picture showing that the fat coming out of the voice inject cannula is intact and contains viable adipocytes. We performed several studies showing cell viability and intact cell membranes of the fat coming out of the cannula. If you go back in the processing and the first step is the liposuction, you have pretty much the same picture. You have intact cells, intact cell membranes. And if you have the question if centrifugation is a problem for the cells, you can show that the centrifugation we are using, 3000 rounds per minute for five minutes, has not an impact to the cell viability. So from this point, we have a conclusion that cell viability is not altered by centrifugation at the application over the voice in check cannula and our cell membranes of adipocytes are still intact after the processing using the centrifugation. So another important question is, is fat really only a filler? And are there maybe other components than only the adipocytes inside a lipoaspirate? And that is why we have performed a molecular characterization of the lipoaspirates, which were obtained from the voice inject system. This study published in 2019 in JAMA Facial Plastic Surgery was performed using so-called explant cultures, where we characterized the cells growing out of a lipoaspirate. And we found, and this is um, not a real surprise and was described by several authors in the past, but we found also in the 
a system using the, the voice inject liposuction and injection device that there are high amounts of so-called Mesenheimer stem cells. Those cells were positive for CD73, CD19, and CD105, and those findings were again confirmed by immune histochemistry examinations. That means that our lipoaspirates also contain stem cells with the compatibility for adipogenic, osteogenic and chondrogenic differentiation. The next step was to characterize the secretory function of those cells and we found high amounts of important growth factors, for example, for angiogenesis in the supernatants of those cells. And we found that the supernatants were able to improve wound healing in those scratch assays and to accelerate cell migration. Those findings are in line with other publications showing that adipogenic stem cells, so-called ASCs, have important effects on wound healing due to direct cell interaction and as well due to their paracrine function by the secretion of important growth factors. So my second step of conclusion is that lipotransfer has an enormous potential beyond the soft tissue augmentation in regenerative medicine because lipoaspirates contain relevant amounts of stem cells and those cells produce growth factors and show multi-lineage differentiation. Both of those characteristics are important for wound healing and regeneration of tissue. Furthermore, lipoaspirates show remarkable properties for the other applications beyond the correction of volume deficit. So that means that fat is more than a filler and we have important effects for tissue regeneration by adipose derived stem cells. Those effects can be beneficial to treat chronic radiation injuries, to treat poor healing wounds, for example, after breast cancer surgery, but also in the head and neck area. Currently, there are several clinical studies listed for the use of adipose-derived stem cells in regenerative medicine. They include those typical applications for breast augmentation and general burns and scars, but they also include interesting applications of fat to treat fistulas and diabetic ulcers. With respect to our discipline, the otorhinolaryngology, you can use fat in multiple applications. One example is shown here where we have used a fat injection to a pharyngocutaneous fistula with an excellent healing result. Another possibility is to inject the enlarged tracheoesophagus fistula to make the opening smaller and to make it easier for the reinsertion of a dislocated voice prothesis. Of course, you can use fat as a filler for the augmentation of retracted scars and scar revision cases. And you can also use fat for the correction of volume deficits after the resection of head and neck cancer tumors as described in this example. And finally, we would like to go back to the larynx and I will um, share with you these two um, pictures showing the so-called primary augmentation after chordectomy. From my point of view, a very innovative and helpful treatment for patients with a T1A glottic larynx cancer 
and if you have a look to the picture on the right you can see that the effect of fat injection goes far beyond the effect of a filler and you can see this regeneration of the surface of the injected vocal fold. So let's share with you some more important publications for further reading. One um, publication very recently published um, gives you some more information about long-term effects of fat injection to the larynx. Then you can have a nice um, review about stem cell approaches for vocal fold regeneration by Fishman. And um, you can also have a look to this publication, which was focused on the difference of um, adipose tissue and the stem cells located there and bone marrow um, derived stem cells for vocal fold scarring. Finally, we have to um, keep in mind that fat transplantation has to be oncologically safe and we have to discuss always the long-term stability. With respect to those two issues of safety and long-term stability, it is mandatory that also from otolaryngology societies clinical trials on lipotransfer are performed. We need to standardize our procedures to achieve guidelines analog to them of the colleagues from the general plastic surgery. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm very happy to answer your questions later on. So, what about the vocal outcome now? And this is the most important thing, of course, for you. And if we look for the outcome, of course, it's not very easy to measure because this is very multidimensional in order to measure voice. You could have a look for the aerodynamic, which we use um, a spirometry. You can see the oscillatory dynamics by means of high-speed dignity imaging or stroboscopy, perceptional aspects, self-evaluation as by means of the voice handicap index, or further acoustics like the voice range profile, electroglottography, and so on, which we use here in Munich. To give you a short impression, um, if you have a look for Walker Ford immobility, then it is quite clear that you have a strong effect. Here you can see an immobility of the left vocal fold, strong induction of the ventricular folds. And if you have a look two days after surgery, the closure is much better, but maybe a bit too small, even though you find some over augmentation, which is present here. Eight weeks after a fat augmentation, you have quite comfortable voice, and the patient was very, very much um, satisfied with the vocal function. However, even if you have this vocal fold immobility, you have sometimes complications. One typical complication is the rise of hematomas. Here you can see also um, uh, immobility of the right vocal fold, and then we used um, the fat augmentation by the speaker tire system. And you find here in hematoma. It is quite important that you use a bit more than you would suggest. Usually you say fat you need like 10 to 20 percent more than you use. For the Spiegel and Thai system I would recommend maybe 5 to 10 percent because the material is much better than for the fat augmentation during using high pressure systems. Sometimes you have a very very um, great loss after even a short time period. And if you have here um, an immobility of the left walker fold, we did this augmentation, and this augmentation was working quite nice for the for the um, lady in that case. You can see it is medialized, but even eight weeks after, there was nearly 
no material left. Sometimes the system of the patient maybe reacts differently than in other patients. If we go for the early augmentation, then of course it is quite interesting to have a look how it really works. Here you can see a counter on the left, a walker fold. And if you see surgery, then you see now on the left walker fold here this counter. And this is now um, a bit uh, in the time and short run. And you see here, this was in the anterior commissure, this was no cancer. We did a testing before. And then there's the removal of the T1A by using the laser. And here you can see now that the um, laser is removed. The typical approach, nearly every one of you might be familiar with that. And we remove this glottic cancer. And then, of course, we um, do also a pathology um, of the margins. And after all margins are uh, inside the uh, surgery are, um, are free of cancer, then we could do an early augmentation. Now you see here the defect, the strong defect. Now we take the fat within the same surgery. And now you see the muscle, of course. And now the augmentation starts. And you reestablish within the same surgery the voice. Here you can see also the 5 to 10% over augmentation, which we would recommend here and after surgery the patient has a voice of course there uh, there's a wound healing also faults. but after eight weeks there's a quite clear voice by the patient And this is not a single case, there are further cases. And here you can see that the beginning sometimes is a bit problematic, of course, because of the, um, the non-oscillating uh, walker fold after augmentation. But after, uh, after eight weeks, with a quite comfortable voice, after this cordectomy, we could not. cancer. Of course you need an over augmentation and sometimes the material um, goes to the uh, subglottic areas, um, sometimes supraglottic, but you have to keep calm here. Um, something here you can see the cancer of course of the right walker fold and now you can see here how much um, there was an over augmentation one week after uh, and even 10 weeks after you have a quite good voice. There's a still a, a small granuloma, which I removed later. But um, the, the patient is very satisfied with the voice after fat injection. The perceptual aspects are great in order to um, to have a look for the roughness, the breathiness, and the hoarseness. There's a great increase even half a year after surgery. Now you find in red lines um, augmentations after immobility, after scar in green, after cordectomy in blue, and atrophy in yellow. 
And there is a greater effect, a positive effect, by means of the self-evaluation concerning the voice handicap index, nearly for all of the subjects, but one subject um, with the atrophy. The aerodynamics are changing a bit, but not as strong as you would suggest. So subclotic pressure is not the mean task to do this augmentation, um, but there are small changes visible here. What you can see is that the dynamic range of the voices improve by means of the augmentation. That is what you want, of course, that you could speak loud, that you could sing loud, or even so if you want to. The regularity means of jitter is also better for nearly all of the subjects. For the scar tissue, sometimes there are still problems and you can't prevent the scar by means of augmentation. You could improve a bit more the oscillation patterns, but not as strong as for other indications. The glottal to noise excitation rate, which is an, a measure of the breathiness, um, is much improved also um, for all these uh, indications. And the dysphonia severity index, which describes the mean vocal function, is also for most of the subjects better after such augmentations. All in all, FET augmentation using the centrifugation uh, method by Spiegel and Theis has for some patients a temporary effect. I would not suggest that it is a permanent effect. Maybe some permanent effect will remain, but we can't verify them for vocal function. The great advantage is, not yet um, mentioned, that you have no limitation of the amount of material. If you have a very strong defect, you have nearly incredible much uh, material, you can uh, insert maybe three milliliters if you want to. Every other material like hyaluronic acid or uh, like hydroxyl appetite are limited to one milliliter syringes. It does not greatly affect the surgical time, to be honest. All the um, uh, taking this fat out of the body takes you maybe 10 minutes, nothing more, and the augmentation is not not very time consuming. The fat itself is associated with a very high compliance by the patient. And this is one of the most important reasons to use this material. And it could be easily used for early augmentation for both vocal fold immobility or after cordectomy. And maybe we will see in the future could reveal stem cell effects. To be honest, in the very beginning, and with my own experience from, from high pressure syringes, in fat, I was not the greatest fan of taking fat again. Nowadays, if it would be my brother, my daughter, I would for sure use fat in the very beginning, maybe another material thyroplasty after. But I'm, I think this fat is very easy to use and a very good alternative. Thank you very much. And I hope you have some interesting questions for both Dr. Hauptner and me. Thank you. Thank you both, Professor Echtenach and uh, Dr. Hauptner, for these two great presentations. Uh, it was uh, a pleasure listening to it. I really enjoyed the 60 minutes. Um, even though, before we hand over to my colleagues that uh, we received quite a few questions from the market, I do have a personal question that actually goes um, to uh, Dr. Hauptner. You were mentioning in your presentation that you centrifuge the harvest's autologous um, fat for about five minutes. Uh, we usually um, say that three minutes would be sufficient. Uh, what about the two extra minutes that you uh, use for your um, process? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, from my point of view, um, probably the three minutes are um, enough in most of the cases, but if you add two more minutes, you can just remove some more of oil and debris and you have probably um, a more um, effective um, solution uh, containing more viable fat and stem cells. It's just from my experience. Uh, I do not really know if there is a great difference between the three and the five minutes, but if you just go on for the two more minutes, you, you 
can see that there are some more um, uh, um, volume uh, units, maybe one uh, cc more of blood or oil removed from this step. All right. So in other words, the density would be higher and the quality better? Yes. Yeah. And um, the data I have shown in my presentation actually um, are achieved from the five-minute um, centrifugation process. So um, there is um, a high amount of viable cells that actually you cannot really see a difference between um, uh, the, the fat cells coming out of the body and the, the cells coming out of the voice inject cannula. So um, yeah, that is, was very important for us to show if the processing has any kind of effect on cell viability. And um, yeah, as you have said, um, if you have the chance to have a higher density of cells and um, can reduce the, the amount of blood and oil, then it's probably the better way to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I would now like to hand over to my colleague, Martin Koch, and I was informed he has quite a few questions. So, um, Martin, can you, can you hear me? I cannot. No, no he, he's coming, I guess. Hello, Matthias. I can hear you, but obviously you can't see me. Do you hear me? We do hear you. Yes. Okay. So, Martin, um, you have received quite a few questions from the market that you would like to address now to Professor Eichtenach and Dr. Hauptner. So, what are those? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Eichtenach and Dr. Hauptner, for these interesting lectures. Um, so, my, my video does not work perfectly. I don't know the reason for that. But anyway, you can hear me, so I can address... Ah, now, now we are... Now I'm on board. Thanks very much. Okay, so I have uh, gathered quite a few questions to various uh, topics um, during those lectures. Um, the most frequent one, we from Spiegel and Ties and our distributors are addressed uh, to is regarding difference between local anesthesia and uh, general anesthesia for the whole procedure. Um, and um, we always uh, keep telling everybody um, um, that we strongly recommend to do the procedure under general anesthesia. Is there anything else, else to add from your side to those kind of questions? I guess uh, maybe I take the question. Um... I guess there are many possibilities, of, uh, of course, to do so. And the general anesthesia is very important for high precision. And if you go for the approach of the cordectomy, then you have no other chance than doing it in general anesthesia. Also, if you have a need of very high precision, if you go for Reinke space, so for the superficial lamina propria, um, you can't really uh, deal with, a, with, a gag, with any gag reflex or any imprecision. So you have to be very precise in the sub-millimeter regions. So only because of the injectional part, the augmentation part, you have a need of general anesthesia. If you go for immobility, that is quite easy to perform. So there you could go for local anesthesia, uh, local anesthesia as well. Uh, for the uh, sulcus vocalis, it is a difficult question, but most of the patients do not really like um, the harvesting of the fat in local anesthesia and then going for the, uh, for the larynx for the augmentational part. Um, so therefore, my own impression is we usually do it in general anesthesia because of the precision. And, um, but if you want to control voice for immobility parts, you could go all, also for the local anesthesia. Yeah, and it depends always on the indications. And if you go to other indications like uh, treating 
facial scarring or the examples um, I have shown to you, um, like the uh, leakage of an voice prothesis or uh, treating any kind of fistula. We have done that in the past um, also in uh, local anesthesia, actually together with deadlift um, ties in the past um, for the first treatments. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another question regarding uh, local anesthesia. In the video, video we've seen um, Dr. Haupner doing the part or adding some kind of local anesthesia, adding some medication with local for local anesthesia in the part of harvesting fat. Um, whereas um, uh, we, we know or no, there, there is discussion about that regarding um, the medication having an influence in, in influence, maybe a negative influence in the harvested fat molecules. Can you explain something about that? Yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. Actually, there was a lot of discussion in the past if um, adding local anesthesia and epinephrine to the tumescent solution um, has any kind of effect on the cell viability. And that was already yeah, also very important for us to show that it is not the case. Um, and um, I have shown to you uh, some of um, yeah, review data and the recommendation of the American Academy of Facial and General Plastic Surgery. And they do actually recommend to use tumescent solution in combination with um, centrifugation. So um, the key message is, um, yeah, we and others have shown that if you do it in that way, you have no uh, effect on the cell viability. So, um, because the idea is you are removing um, all the uh, um, drugs and um, the epinephrine together with the lidocaine is some kind of drug and you are removing it from your lipoaspirate by the centrifugation. Uh, thank you very much for that answer, which is um, already answering one of the next questions which uh, arrived, uh, which was, um, why is centrifugation mandatory at all? Uh, one reason might be the one you just described. Are there more reasons? Yeah, actually, yeah. You know, there was a really a lot of work done um, by other colleagues in the past, and there are a lot of different ways to harvest and to, to process fat. And if you are using that kind of manual um, liposuction we are doing, then you, your lipoaspirate contains just a lot of debris and blood and oil. And it's really important to, to clean that out. But there are also other ways possible. And if you have a look to the very impressing um, results um, recently published by um, Lateva and colleagues. Um, they are not using centrifugation. They are um, using um, tumescent solutions or lidocaine with epinephrine, and they are just waiting for spontaneous sedimentation. That's also possible if you do not have the centrifuge available. But um, as Professor Echternach um, said in his talk, um, just to speed up your, your um, surgical approach, it's nice to have the centrifuge available in the OR. And so you do not need to wait for the spontaneous sedimentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, some other questions regarding um, um, the revision rate. Um, do you see an improvement in revision rate or which kind of improvement do you expect using autologous fact in comparison to synthetic fillers? Well, it depends on the synthetic filler, of course. <laughs> well, um, my, my experience after two years now using your system, the spigotized system, is that we have to revise, of course, uh, after six to nine months. And then I usually uh, do a permanent approach like thyroplasty or like silicon augmentation or anything like that. So you have to revise. Um, and the great study by Lahoff and colleagues shows a permanent effect, but I have some doubts here from our own data. We can't really resolve 
the problem why and um, whether it's um, the harvesting the fat, the suctional system or not. But our um, we have only a temporary effect there. And then we go for a permanent thing after. Here it's quite important, of course, um, that there's a difference if you augment fat and or if you augment hydroxyl apatite or silicon, it's different because stiffness is greater for the last two materials and the fat itself is quite pliable. So usually you see better amplitudes if you have an immobility after fat augmentation, which helps uh, the voice. Um, not yet mentioned, but it, this is uh, also an uh, advantage uh, of the Spiegetai system. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question uh, is about post-operative treatment. Is there a difference in post-operative treatment um, using autologous fat compared to synthetic filler? Or uh, is the recommendation the same to the patient? It's nearly the same. To be honest, um, if you would expect, if you augment hydroxyl appetite or silicon, some scar tissue arising for stability of the material. And uh, what you want to avoid is a shifting of the material. If you use fat, you have an over augmentation like 10% or something like that. And um, this is not as much for silicon. I would, I usually use approximately 5% only. And um, for the fat, um, it is a bit more easy to use the voice after surgery. If you have a permanent material, you want to avoid that there's a shift to, let's say, the subglottic structures. And um, therefore, this shift has to be avoided. So for fat, is, you could start a bit earlier. Usually for both cases, we recommend two days of voice rest. And after two days, and they are allowed to speak for two weeks in a very low, uh, low position. If you do like that and speak like that, a bit more on the uh, singing voice, then it is quite easy, and you have no stress on your system. So that is allowed. Okay. Uh, here's another question just coming in from Dr. Kinari. I don't know uh, which country he comes from, but. Um, the question is, what technique would you prefer for anesthesia, intubation or jet ventilation? Well, um, usually I started with jet ventilation, but now we take a, a 5.0 or 4.5 um, tube, and I feel very comfortable with that. To be honest, if you take general anesthesia, you have to exactly know the stroboscopy because the patient isn't awake. And you have to precisely study in front of the surgery how the oscillation patterns are and how much material you would need to augment. And therefore, um, this is more important than any kind of, uh, whether it's related to jet ventilation or to uh, um, a tube uh, intubation. But uh, jet ventilation is not jet ventilation. You could go um, superior to the Walker Folds. That I would not recommend, to be honest, because then you have some movement of the Walker Folds. And you have to go very deep uh, inside the trachea to avoid such movements of the Walker Folds in order to achieve as much precision as you would like. Okay, thank you very much. Questions are coming in. <laughs> Uh, during right. <laughs> the, our discussion here. Uh, here's one from Dr. Kameli. Uh, if the quantity of fat is not enough, can we repeat the procedure? Easily, very easily. Of course you could do. That is no problem at all. In one operation or some, some days or weeks later? Well, um, you see the real result weeks later to be honest. Okay. So therefore, if, if you take like eight to nine milliliters of fat, which is not too much, to be honest, you get maybe like three milliliters you could inject at least. And okay. three milliliters, that is enough for a cordectomy. So you have for each uh, liposuction enough material. This is a great advantage, of course. And But if you think that the overestimation was not good enough, you could, of course, repeat it uh, some weeks after, but I would recommend to wait maybe for three to four weeks 
that the os oscillatory system is quite stable and you have to uh, reevaluate the system in front of each surgery, how much material you really would need. But think that the mass is different between left and right vocal fold after that. You can't avoid some aperiodicities concerning to the so-called eigenmode, so the oscillation pattern of each vocal fold. So sometimes it's quite nice to have some augmentation also on the healthy side, just in order to, um, to reestablish um, two quite comparable masses. Okay, thank you very much. Here's another question. Um, I'm not sure, but I think you, you uh, explained it in your, in your lecture already. But anyway, um, could fat be used instead of a prothesis or pro some kind of as a prothesis material in a pyroplasty as well? I guess Dr. Hauptner already have shown, yes, of course you could. You, you could use fat for, for tracheostoma. You could, for thyroplasties, I, I use usually uh, the titanium, um, sometimes cartilage because it's more stable. And then you don't have to close up the, your window, your buildup. And usually I prefer the thyroplastic and local anesthesia because you are easy to control the voice. And, um, but you could use it at very different places. In my own uh, area um, and field, you could do it for swallowing problems in the vitophyllangeal area and so on. You could take fat wherever you want to. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, one more question um, addressed to Dr. Hauptner uh, regarding his own experience. In your lecture, you said uh, the effect of fat injection goes deeper than using other fillers. Could you explain this a little bit more? Probably not deeper, but um, there are long lasting effects possible. And if you just have a look to, to our pictures documented from the patients um, after chordectomy, um, you can really appreciate this new built vocal fold. So there are um, regenerative effects inside the tissue and we are still working on to understand them in detail. But there are nice animal studies done in the past in scarring and um, they show that if you inject fat, the... Um, the stem cell effect um, leads to um, more viscoelasticity and probably the paracrine effects. Um, they work in a way that neovascularization is possible in the field. And we have more than only the volume there, the pure volume of fat. We have other regenerative effects as well. And that is what I would like to say, it is more than a filler. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question addressed to Professor Echtenach. Um, we have learned in your, in your lecture that pliability is, is, very much in, is a very much important aspect here. Um, the ability of tissue to oscillate is, is important. Um, is there a, a, a difference in um, um, improving this pliability using this, using uh, autologous pad instead of um, synthetic fillers? Is there a big difference or mm -hmm. can you a little bit more? I guess pliability is the most important key for every phonosurgery. So it's if you remove the, the polyp or if you have a rank of space, there's not, it's not very important to have a discussion about if you use a flap or not. It is the pliability, especially of the superficial lamina propria. So that is the most important thing because this mucosa wave you, you have to produce is very important for your voice source and therefore for every vocal capacity. And yes, my experience is that for silicon, for hydroxyl appetite, you have a scar um, growing up for stability of the material and this increased stiffness, if you increase stiffness, of course, the pliability decreases, not too much, but it decreases. And if you compare 
augmentations for immobility of the vocal folds, then I would suggest that fat has a better pliability than both other materials. Um, so that is uh, the answer. Um, if you go for the Ranker space for augmentation, please do not really do that. That is really very tricky and um, that is not easy. And there's no material known that many materials have been used in the past to reestablish Ranker space. Sometimes you could try that only for scar tissue. This is the only explanation. Maybe also for a sulcus vocalis, if you take the Busher years technique, where you remove the sulcus um, and then you take maybe a, a suture, then you could use fat uh, inside the Ranker space. But I would not recommend it here. Please do it at the lateral proportion inside the thyroid arytenoid or a bit lateral to that. Then you have a good push up, a good barking of the Walker folds. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have worked uh, on all our questions now. There's only one, which is which is um, more from our team, excuse me, which is, um, would you be available for another uh, webinar like this in the Latin American uh, territory? <laughs> Spoken from myself, of course, because I do believe that this technology is great, to be honest. Um, this is not because of your company, to be honest. Uh, but I was really not convinced of FAT by using high pressure systems. And it was really coming out to every place I didn't want it to. And starting with the speed tie system was really a, a, a game changer. And um, for me, so I do believe in the system. I do believe that this is a good alternative. It is not the entire truth, but it is a good alternative to use in the portfolio. And of course, I would uh, be happy to help you there. I'm okay. not fluent in Spanish, but I will work on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But to be much. honest, I would, I would more do it personally than doing a Zoom conference. I really <laughs> appreciate the Zoom conference and appreciate all the uh, spectators here. Um, sorry for the inconvenience in the very beginning. But I guess the most important things are the small talks beside each uh, each conference to have the easy questions answered. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I will hand over now to um, to ah sorry. Just one more information. The, Question from Dr. Kinari was from University Hospital in Helsinki. Oh, so, wonderful. Uh, we, are, we are present in Finland now as well. Okay. Many greetings to Ahmed Kinait. <laughs> and um, I will hand over to Matthias Goita now, um, who will uh, end this session now. Yeah, I'm I'm listening to you, but unfortunately the camera won't be um, won't turn on. So, but we can do it that way. That's fine too. So, first of all, I'm I'm really really amazed about the quality of questions that we have received so far, and um, on top the the potential that comes with autolog is fed, and I'm I'm really really happy to um, to have the chance to listen to you, and it was um, to me uh, very eye opening. So it's a it's a great product. And it's a great technique. It's not about the product there. It's about the approach and the technique and the potential of comes with autologous fat. So this is, this is very good news. Um, now, here I am. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, again, thank you very much for your, for your time and for all your, your work you've put in here. Um, I'm sure everybody enjoyed it, um, even though we had the little hiccups in the beginning. But um, if anybody wants to watch the whole webinar again, please feel free and go on our homepage. We will um, put it there under our downloads um, if you want to listen to the webinar again. But other than that, I, I think we're all very happy and satisfied. And I want to say thank you um, from the whole team. And uh, yeah, wish you a nice evening. <laughs>